Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0, the only podcast that focuses on mental health while mixing in movies, music, books, sports, and pop culture. Here are your hosts, Rebecca and Joe Lombardo. Hey, good morning, and welcome to Voices for Change 2.0. Hey there, good morning. Thank you for joining us on this fine weekend. We hope you guys are enjoying your day. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny. i, I got to mention this really quick, babe. Okay. You know, we, we've got our intro and, and our, our wonderful announcer that says we're the only podcast that mixes in movies and music and, and all that stuff that he says. And it occurs to me, we need to do that more. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good. We, that would be good. Well, we're doing it today. So. Yes, yes, we are absolutely. <laughs> so let's let's just go with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, recently, Joe and I had the pleasure of viewing a mental health documentary called Healing Voices. It presents a different perspective than any of the other films that we've seen on this topic. Uh, today, we're talking with the director of Healing Voices, P.J. Moynihan. He began, he began this journey as a filmmaker with a vision, but he has become an advocate with a mission. So please welcome PJ to the show. Good morning. Hey there. Uh, so. Thank you both for having me. We'll, 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 we'll settle into our flow here shortly. Yeah, we will. We'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll get the hang of it here. Yep. Um, if you don't have any questions for us, we're going to just go ahead and dive right in. Let's go for it. Okay. Sweet. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and uh, describe your role in this project? Sure. Uh, So the name of my production company is Digitalized Film. Uh, I started the company right out of college in 2003, uh, you know, where we produce independent media, uh, you know, mainly documentaries. um, But, you know, we also produce what I like to refer as social impact media uh, for kind of a global client base. Um, and I really believe in the power of media to affect change and, and measurable and meaningful change in our in our world and in our societies. Um, so that's really, you know, kind of what our our niche has become over uh, about 13 or 14 years. Um, you know, so we work on projects large and small. But, you know, this uh, this particular film that we're here to discuss today, Healing Voices, um, you know, this has been a project that we've been working on for you know, going on six, seven years, I, I think, at this point. And, you know, it's not uncommon for an independent film to have sort of that uh, that sort of life cycle um, from conception to distribution. And, you know, we spent about five years producing the film, um, and we've spent a good part of the last year and a half to two years, um, you know, marketing and self-releasing the film. So, you know, as an independent production wow. company, we're not just producing media, we're also delivering it. Um, and, you know, part of what I hope we can talk about today is how we've approached kind of the, the delivery system with Healing Voices, which um, has proven really effective and I think really kind of allowed the film to, to resonate with people in such a way that probably wouldn't have been, um, it wouldn't have been prone to if it, was, if it followed more traditional distribution paths. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah you know, and we can, we can absolutely discuss that um i I have no problem with that at all um can you talk a little bit about what healing voices is about sure so healing voices is a social action documentary about mental health um you know social action in the sense that you know we produced the film uh going back to about 2010 when myself and oryx cohen who's my co-producer decided to embark down this path oryx is also one of the subjects in the film um, because we really believe there was a need to, you know, kind of have a different conversation than we're having socially, culturally about mental health. Um, that, you know, Oryx and, and some of his colleagues here, I'm, I'm based in Massachusetts, so in, in Western Massachusetts, I live in Northampton, and I had the good fortune of meeting Oryx and his friend Will Hall, um, who were doing some pretty radical work here, um, you know, at, around mental health advocacy and activism. Uh, They had started an an organization called uh, the Freedom Center. And the Freedom Center was a a group of folks who who were meeting on on the grassroots, um, you know, in church basements, kind of just very uh, on their own. And they were looking at at ways to kind of rethink madness and and just kind of re-evaluate how we respond to people who are in uh, emotional 
and psychological crisis. And a lot of these people had been through the traditional mental health system and had found that the, that the traditional way of responding didn't necessarily work for them. And even for some of them, they felt they had been harmed by the system. So it was really a very grassroots approach towards saying, how can we, uh, as people who have been through a particular set of experiences, kind of band together and come up with better solutions than the, the solutions that were provided to us in our time of need. So Healing Voices wow. is really, you know, it kind of chronicles um, the story. It chronicles the story of three individuals. We follow them over about five years, and you know, there and there are um, Oryx is one of the subjects in the film. There's a, a woman named Jen Constantine who is a a mother and, a, and an activist living out in South Dakota, who's one of the subjects of the film, and a young man named Dan Sullivan, who lives in, in my neck of the woods here in Amherst, Massachusetts, who is the, the third subject in the film. And the film follows these individuals over the course of their lives and kind of ex- explores with them how, um, you know, they have found sort of their own ways to live with the experiences that are commonly labeled you know, serious mental illness or, or psychosis or, or schizophrenia. So it's, uh, you know, one of the nice things about doing the film over a longer sort of trajectory, I uh, sort of took about five years to fully produce it, is that, you know, you kind of see things happen in, in people's lives over that course of time. Um, and we really wanted the film to be character centric and not just, you know, kind of a more of a traditional talkie talkie documentary, though there is that element to the film. as Right. Well. Um, Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Actually, I, my, my next question was about the, uh, social action initiative part. So, um, what what kind what does that mean to you specifically as as it pertains to this this film? Just so we kind of get that out there for people so that they understand it fully. Sure. So, to me, the social action piece is you know presenting a different way of looking at these experiences than than most people have been presented. Um, in terms of, you know, what they're hearing from um, maybe their, their doctors or their families or, you know, kind of society in general. Um, so the action is to get people to think somewhat differently um, and acknowledge that these are sort of human experiences that, that affect all of us at different ways and in different times. And, and the action that we've really organized around Healing Voices is, um, th- you know, the film being followed by community dialogues. So, you know, the, the film is meant to evoke dialogue. It's meant to, you know, kind of challenge some people's beliefs or, or maybe validate others um, or open up these opportunities for conversation um, where in, in, in sometimes difficult conversations, but, you know, we, we have this, we have structured a business model where the film has been screening since we released it last spring in April uh, all over the world. It's been between four and 500 screenings at this point. And every single screening wow. has been followed by, by a discussion. Um, you know, there's usually some sort of panel um, that, you know, is, is constituted from, you know, people that organize the screening or maybe some local stakeholders in the mental health or public health communities. Um, but it's really meant to, you know, to, to engage the audience, the people that have, been, that have sat there and, and watched the film for 90 minutes, many of whom are showing up at these events because they've been touched by these issues in their life in some way. Um, and, and in a range of ways, you know, from healthcare professionals to working within the traditional systems to family members looking for solutions to people that are, um, you know, that are, maybe not necessarily in crisis in that moment, but looking for um, other ways of, exta- of understanding and, uh, you know, their experiences. So the action is the dialogue, and the, and, and the action is really bringing communities together. Um, you know, I, I think this is a bit of a lost art in the sense that, you know, I, I don't think there are many events in, in people's local communities where, you know, the intention is to come together in order to have an experience and then participate in sort of a town hall style discussion. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'm saying for us to kind of organize it around a film has been a very interesting, um, it's been a very interesting model to watch unfold. And I think there's been a real measurable impact in communities that has come out of these screenings um, everywhere from, you know, Iceland to New York city, to Los Angeles, to Australia, uh, where they really seem to like the film. I mean, it's kind of taken on a life of its own in many ways, but it's also because we, had a particular framework for how we thought the film was, would be well utilized. You know, we didn't just want to release this thing immediately and have people watching it in their living rooms. Um, we've actually withheld it for the last year from sort of, you know, consumer um, purchase, let's say, you know, the 999 download or the, the 499 right. rental, or because we wanted the action to be about people coming together and experiencing the film and responding to it. Um, and just, you know, we had, uh, uh, 
you know, while I'm on the subject, we had a really great example of that last night. You know, we had a screening not far from where I live in Millbury, Massachusetts. You know, I'm, I'm in Northampton in the Pioneer Valley. Boston's on the other side of the state. Millbury is like somewhere in the middle. Um, okay. And, you know, on a, on a rainy Monday night here in New England, uh, you know, we had 150 people come out into a great independent local theater. We had four or five state legislators there. We had the, the area director for the Department of Mental Health on our panel. Um, you know, we had a bunch of local sponsors who represented not just mental health, you know, but, you know, Disability Action America, um, Our Revolution Grafton, um, Asian Women for Health, uh, the Kiva Center and the Central Mass Recovery Learning Community were peer-run organization. They were the, the presenting sponsor. Um, you know, there were some wow. other mental health related sponsors. So really a diverse constituency of people. And it just, I think, speaks to how these, these issues affect everyone. Um, in every area of public health, in every, in every area of day-to-day life. And so I think that what we've seen through the business model of doing these community events is that people are ready for this message. Um, and it's not just the people that, you know, are kind of most directly impacted by these issues. Yeah, yeah that's, mm-hmm. that's amazing that you've got that diverse of groups coming in and participating in it. And I think it's awesome that, you know, you've got it kind of how do I want to put it you bring it one community at a time you know what I mean uh it, it you, you're absolutely right that there isn't the sense of community that there used to be you know 50 60 years ago you know where you could have you know some type of uh town hall discussion locally that the people in the community will come together and and you know talk about various things and you know especially especially not mental health exactly you know and and to have that type of subject and so many different people coming out to discuss it um is just it's awesome you know it's, it's extremely important because that's what we're all doing we're all working towards the time when it is something that we can just discuss and there's no stigma related to it and everybody can be together and, you know, present their opinion in a logical and intelligent way. A compassionate way. A compassionate way, obviously, yes, without, you know, being made to feel as if they're less than because they may have a mental illness. Yeah, or to be judged or exactly. and, anything and like that. And, you know, when you're speaking about your event last night, I just I want to put out there for anyone that's listening in uh, our area in uh, Detroit, Michigan, Joe and I are looking to do one of these screening events ourselves. And, you know, we need some help. So uh, if you guys, if you know anybody or, you know. Or you want to participate, you know, exactly. please reach out to us. Uh, you know, <laughs> we're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Our right. website is wwwvoices dash four dash change dot net you can reach us that way and uh you know let us know if you if you want to uh give us a hand with it because i know pj would love to see the the uh document travel documentary travel all the way to the detroit area absolutely absolutely hey pj um in the film there are times when people refer to themselves as survivors of psychiatry. Uh, would you talk a bit about this point of view? Sure. I, I think, you know, that refers to people that have been through the mental, you know, the traditional mental health system that feel that the system was, was harmful to them as opposed to helpful to them. Um, and so that, you know, includes you know, many people who have had really traumatic experiences in hospitals, um, you know, people that have, you know, kind of been forced to take medication against their will. Um, and, you know, it, and there really is a, kind of a, a grassroots global movement of folks who identify as such that are, you know, that are not just saying, um, hey, look, at what's wrong with this system that are also, you know, very creatively and passionately, um, you know, trying to bring forth solutions for, you know, for themselves, for their loved ones, for communities, um, so that, you know, people don't end up having the, this, have to go down the same path that they did, you know, I, and I know, you know, obviously one of the things having shown the movie so many times and having had all these dialogues, I mean, I want to be very clear that we are, we are respectful of anyone's choices. 
that you know that, mm-hmm. that what the film is saying largely is there is no one way, um, and that's the message that we're trying to get out there. Um, but it's not about saying you know the traditional thing is you know is, is wrong, and if you believe it, there's something wrong with you. You got to think this other way. I mean that is you know that that's the sort of trap that I think a lot of documentaries fall fall into is sort of thought policing. Um, and this is not that, you know, like I, I absolutely believe there's a place for medication and all this. I absolutely believe there's a place for doctors and all this. I absolutely believe people have the right to, to acknowledge what works for them. Um, but at mm-hmm. the same time, we have to acknowledge that, that you know, that um, just because something is working for a certain set of people or, or, for, or for any one individual, it doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone else. Uh, and so, right. You know, there is, so there's real, I, I believe there's sort of a real lack of diversity and a real lack of options that are presented to people in terms of that moment when they're most vulnerable and they're in crisis. You know, I, I mean, you guys have mm-hmm. interviewed a lot of people and I mean, I have a lot of, let's say, skin in the game in this world. And, you know, <laughs> I, I would imagine you agree that, you know, people know it's, people know what works for them. Right. And so, right. Absolutely, um, yeah. you know, and so, you know, I just think it's important that we, that we listen to everybody in the equation. Um, you know, and, you know, one of the, one of the key constituents that, of, of folks that have been coming to these screenings are healthcare workers. You know, there are many mm-hmm. healthcare workers, people working as, you know, psychiatric nurses or in, you know, sort of traditional settings that are saying, I'm here because I want to be able to provide more solutions to the people that come in in crisis. And when, when someone's in crisis, they're vulnerable, whether it's a family member seeking help for a loved one or somebody, you know, being brave enough to seek help for themselves, um, you know, that's a real point of vulnerability. And so, you know, we just want to be really clear that the, the, the message I believe that people are given in many cases is a, is a very powerful ne- message um, that is kind of inherently negative. You know, sort of a, a, a disease mm-hmm. model approach, I believe, you know, has a certain effect on someone's psychology and how they are going to respond to, um, to whatever it is that they're going through. And so we're saying that there are spiritual elements to these experiences. We're saying that there are tr- a, a huge uh, level of, of trauma and a lot of early childhood trauma uh, in terms of people that end up in, in crisis. I mean, I think we live in a very, very complex and complicated society. I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties. I'm just glad that there wasn't social media when I was in high school, because I can't imagine what it's like <laughs> to be a kid right now. I mean, it's just oh, yeah. there's this constant, we live in this comparison culture where everyone's just trying to like build an image of themselves. And when you don't live up to that image, you know, you just feel like you're failing in some way. And I just, um, and, you know, and yeah. I have, and I have young kids and a daughter who is, uh, you know, just started in college. And I mean, it's really just, I think a challenging time and place and day and time to, to be alive in, in America in particular. And I think all this stuff comes into play when we talk about mental health. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you, you know, and, um, you know, for, for the kids out there, they're, they're under a lot of pressure, you know, like you mentioned with social media and whatnot. Especially if they themselves have found out that they have a condition or are afraid that they have mm-hmm. some type of a condition, you know, there's already such a standard that they're feeling that they're being withheld, you know, held up to. And then, and and then, then it gets compact, uh, compounded. Exactly by by something by by a disease or or a condition, and, and it makes them feel like an outsider. And you know, then there's the other kids who you know, are the bullies and, Mm -hmm. you know, bullying people on the internet. And it's just, I agree with you. I I can't imagine, you know, it was hard enough going (laughs) to school without the internet. I can't even imagine what it would be like nowadays, you know, dealing with it. Deal with that on top of, you know, everything else, you know, when, when we're living in a day and age where kids are committing suicide because of how they're being bullied, uh, over social media, you know, and that's terrifying. That's mm-hmm. absolutely terrifying. It um, is. And, and on a personal <clears throat> level, uh, you know, I know PJ, I spoke to you a little bit about um, if you, the last time we talked about my situation and, you know, that I was diagnosed at 19 with bipolar disorder. And there was a brief period of time when uh, I wasn't seeing anyone after Joe and I first got married because uh, we just, we didn't have insurance. We didn't, we, I just kind of lost my way. And when I finally broke down and went to look for help, 
we couldn't find help to save our lives. Everybody just told us, just go to the emergency room. There's yeah. nothing else you can do. Um, so I've been on that side of it. I've also been on the side where I did find some positive help and was, you know, so grateful for that. So when I watched the film and like I was, I was mentioning to you, Joe and I paused it so many times because you're right about the dialogue aspect of it because we talked literally about every few minutes. Yeah. Of of the film that we watched, we'd pause it and talk to each other about it because we both had been through it together. You know, he's been we've been together for 15 years, so he's been you know by my side through a lot of my you know uh, mental illness ups and downs, right? So, you know, the dialogue aspect of it is certainly there, and I I think it's very important. Um, well, and, and you're saying I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Joe. Go ahead. No, no, go no ahead, problem. PJ. No problem. Please. No, I was just going to say, you know, I, I, I articulated how these community community dialogues are happening, um, and mm-hmm. it. But uh, you know, the example you're citing, I mean, those those. You know, I'm, I'm sure there are just as as many meaningful conversations that will happen in people's living rooms when they're able to mm-hmm. watch the film this way as have happened in sort of out in the in the public with these events that we've been doing. So that is. Um, I just want to acknowledge that that's also, to me, that's also part of the action too, is it's not just about organizing an event and, you know, right. bringing together the community that it's also about, you know, I, I hope that the film is this, it's sort of like a window for people to talk about things and maybe, and maybe in different ways than they had, they had been talking about them before. Um, Absolutely. You know, and so um, that's, that's really how we hope it's, it, it can be utilized as a tool. We think of this as a, as a social tool that we've created. Um, and yes, we're, you know, it's, it is just an entertainment product. It's just a movie after all. And mm-hmm. we're marketing it like, like a movie and doing a lot of the things that many other films that have no social mission are also doing, like working with a publicist and trying to, you know, figure out what, you know, tell our story and, you know, make sure that the thing gets out there. But, um, you know, yeah, that's the, the residual effect of, of, um, you know, how it can impact people's lives is why we believe it's more a tool than a product. Right, right. Absolutely. Well, we are going to have to take a quick break. Uh, We will be playing Brandon and James, Unchained Melody. We'll be right back.
Hey, welcome back to Voices for Change 2.0. I'm Joe. She's Rebecca. That wonderful gentleman over there is PJ. And PJ uh, created the movie Healing Voices. So um, we were talking earlier about, I'm trying to remember how how I want to come into this, um, the whole medical aspect. And, and you had mentioned that, you know, psychiatric nurses were, were coming and seeing the, the screenings and they were looking for new and different ways to approach their patients and stuff. And it got me thinking about something. And, and what that thought is, is, you know, you get a, a physical ailment, you break your arm, uh, you, you come down with diabetes, you, you develop cancer. And generally these physical ailments, there's maybe one or maybe a, a limited number just a few different ways of treating them. And it's pretty consistent for people regardless of, uh, you know, age, race, whatever. Um, when it comes to mental health, and this is nobody's opinion but my own, okay? So anybody in the medical community, you know, can get mad at me if you want. But it seems like the medical field doesn't necessarily consider that when you're dealing with mental health issues, you know, you can't pigeonhole it the way you would a broken arm or something. You know, you have to be open to, you know, the fact that you're dealing with the, with the human brain and it's so complex and, you know, treatment A isn't going to work for treatment, you know, for treatment A won't work for patient A, but it might work for patient B and C and you have to modify it and make it treatment B for patient D stuff like that. You know, it's just something to, to, for, for them to be aware of that, you know, to be open-minded, you know, maybe, maybe medication wouldn't work for, for this person, but therapy would, or, you know, you know what I'm saying? Um, I feel like I'm not articulating myself really well on this, but um, uh, what, what are you, your thoughts, PJ? How, how do you feel about my, my jumbled garbled mess of what I'm trying to say? <laughs> I, no, I, I very much agree with you. And, and you know, I, w- I would take it one step further and say we're not just dealing with the brain; we're dealing with just human consciousness. Mm-hmm. You know, and and, and all and right. all that goes with it. I mean, these are really experiences of consciousness. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's problematic to try and plug people's relationship to the world as they go through it, um, good, bad, or indifferent, into sort of a one-size-fits-all approach. And, and I think that's a lot of where. Um, you know, that's why you have people identifying as survivors of psychiatry. It's why you have, mm-hmm. you know, sort of patient, you know, patient movements rising up around the world and things happening on the grassroots because there's, you know, there have just pulled that that approach hasn't worked for. Um, and I just think that the brain is a much more complex organism than the arm or than, uh, you know, or, I mean, I think when someone ends up with a, with a physical illness and in many ways you can kind of trace back how, you know, kind of how this happens and how, and how, how this came to happen um, and right. how you treat, how you treat it medically. Um, and, you know, I think that part of what's gotten lost in sort of the, in the world of traditional mental health treatment is the, the discovery process of what got the, you know, what landed the person here in the first place, you know, in, in terms, exactly. in terms of, you know, what, what, what experiences in their life um, kind of got them to this point. And when, you know, when people in, kind of go, get to that point of entry with the, the service system, the, the mental health service system, it's just really responding to, at that time, the doctors are responding to symptoms, you know, what are perceived as symptoms, whether it's hearing voices or depression or whatever the symptoms, however the symptoms are presenting themselves. Um, and so, you know, kind of treating the symptoms without trying to understand where the symptoms have come from. I mean, if you, if you're yeah. someone who has diabetes, you know, you probably have eaten too much sugar in your life. You know, um, yep, and so you, and you, so you probably have to start to make some changes in your <laughs> some changes in your in your dietary habits. And you know, in terms of people that have, you know, in, in my words, kind of found their own path to healing outside of tradition of the traditional treatment system. I mean, there's there's no one size fits all mode modality there. But what's very very common is people saying it was this number of things that you know it was going back and kind of you know. It, um, healing from some early childhood trauma or acknowledging that that's what was at, at play here. For some people, it's about making lifestyle changes. 
Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and finding things like meditation, yoga, dietary practices. I mean, I, I think it really is just about a, a, a approach to kind of whole person health. That's probably, that's probably not the right way of saying that, but I mean, it's just really, you know, people finding ways to just live healthier in their lives. Um, is, it seems to be as effective as, you know, as, as just throwing drugs at, at a problem. And so, you know, these are, I just believe these are human conditions and that every single one of us is capable of any sort of psychosis given the right things or the wrong things happening to us at a given time. Um, right. And and so I was going to say it, it, it changes for all of us as we go along the path, you know, as well. You know, one thing, something that worked for us in our 20s may not work for us in our 40s. So you can't, like you both were saying, pigeonhole these diseases because it's ever changing for each individual person. It's not just one group of people in uh, this one thing works for this group of people. Mm-hmm. You know, you break an arm, you put it in a cast usually, and that's pretty standard. Yep. You, your brain isn't functioning properly or you have a chemical imbalance that changes all the time. Exactly. And I think if you put my brain in a cast, I'd probably stop breathing and that wouldn't be good. So. <laughs> yeah, and and um, but, uh, you know, and and so, but then the you know the the broken arm analogy comes back to, you know, this, this conversation around like access to treatment. You know, I'll, so, certainly also people should have access to, um, to healthcare when it comes to this type of thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm not saying we need to completely take it out of that category, but I think that it's much more nuanced than, um, than sort of this traditional one size fits all approach and. And I just think that's gotten lost. And I think, you know, again, coming back to these dialogues, um, they're as much about listening as they are about talking. And mm-hmm. so, you know, uh, I, I think that in many ways what people who are in, in real crisis need is just they need accompaniment. They need someone to listen to them and really kind of uh, meet them where they're at. Um, and, that, and that doesn't really happen often, I believe, in the sort of I'm in crisis. I am I'm now in the ER um, and then maybe in, a, in, in an institution following that, um, there's really no sort of compassionate response, I guess, um, when right. it comes you, to you've, traditional services. You're so right on that. Yeah, that's, you know, that's I, like seeing, that. seeing what Beck's gone through over the last 15 years alone, I can personally vouch for everything you just said. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, during the course of the, of the film, uh, you, it's it's sort of based on on a three people and um their experiences and then they they talk to folks that have been through similar experiences and a lot of them have said that uh they felt sort of forced into taking medication or their only option was medication or their only option was this particular type of treatment so is it safe to say that the people that the film focuses on are not trying to say that, you know, everyone should stop taking their medications or stop seeking treatments if it's been successful for them. No, all they're saying is that medication has not worked for them is all they're saying, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so, and and these are not the narratives that really have made their way into the dominant culture. Um, So again, that was one of our primary motivations for making the film was just to let people know that these stories exist, you know, that people actually do hear voices and live with those voices and learn to healthily live with those voices in constructive ways. And they're not just looking to get rid of those voices because there's some symptom of a disease, um, mm-hmm. you know, that this kind of falls under the diversity of human experience. And, um, and, you know, and I, and I think that one of the things we really try to address in, 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 in some way in the film is just the acknowledgement that, like, where is this line between, you know, like pharmaceutical drugs and recreational drugs? I mean, we, these are all just, these are all psychoactive drugs. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, different drugs affect different people in different ways. I mean, some people drink coffee in the morning, some people don't, some people use cannabis, some some people, you know, they'd smoke a joint and go into, uh, you know, that end up in the ER, we're having a panic attack, you know, so there's all, we, we respond to different substances in different ways as well. And psychiatric medications are 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 a substance, and, and and many people find the substances very very helpful in terms of being able to live the lives that they want to live. 
Um, right. But I also think we've kind of gone, you know, and, and this is not just endemic to mental health. I mean, you could say this for a lot of health care, uh, especially here in America, that we've really gone down this path of just looking for easy, for quick solutions. You know, it's, you can yeah. say it about other aspects of the culture. It's why we eat fast food. You know, it's why we like to simplify things. Um, and so certainly the, you know, the, the, the drug treatment for psychosis is, um, it is, it is that, you know, I, I believe it, it kind of reflects kind of who we are maybe in, in a way culturally, um, in, in, right. in many ways. And we also, you know, uh, there, we also exist in the context of a for-profit healthcare system, you know, so I, I see a lot yeah. of issues that are, that are inherent <laughs> to, that are, that are problematic about sort of the, the mental health treatment system are also problematic in other areas of healthcare where, you know, you have a, a healthcare system that is basically set up to profit from disease. And so there's, there's this lack of investment in um, keeping people Cheers. well, you know, it's not really a, it's not a wellness system. It's a, a disease treatment system. So, you know, exactly. people come in and they, and, and they, and they, you know, we, we treat whatever they're, you know, whatever ails them. Um, but we're not just, you know, trying to keep people out of the doctor's office and, and, and teach them and work with them to lead healthy and meaningful uh, I don't want to say healthy lives. You know, there's a lot of yeah. lifestyle stuff here that I think is is at is at play. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's funny. I, I'm pretty sure that from the pharmaceutical standpoint, we're not looked at as so much as patients as we are consumers. You know, and that's you know kind of a scary thing. You know, when you consider the the record profits that pharmaceutical companies make on an annual basis um and not to sound start sounding all political about it i'm just making a point you know that you know sometimes it's we're almost forced to consider other forms of treatment at times you know and it's not to say that if the medic you know if the medication is working for it and you take and you're taking it by all means keep taking it that's you know, absolutely, you know, do what you need to do to, to help yourself. But I'm also reminded of a scene in the movie where I think it was Dan mentioned that, you know, when he was taking one of the medications, he didn't feel like himself anymore. And once he had stopped taking it, he started feeling like himself again. And I've seen that with Rebecca. You know, there was a medication that she was on years ago that, I don't know. It just, she, she wasn't her. She was a little numb. And, you know, once she, and we figured out that the medication was having a few other effects on her as well besides that. And once she stopped taking it, she was, she was her again, you know? So I absolutely under, understand that, that, you know, it's, it's messing with your brain chemistry, you know, and sometimes, to your benefit, sometimes to your detriment. And there, and again, there's substances. I mean, Rebecca, to come all the way back to your question about, you know, our, you know, since the characters, the, the subjects of the film, you know, they're kind of advocating, you know, medication didn't work for them. Uh, it doesn't mm-hmm. mean necessarily, necessarily that the message is everyone go throw away your medication. I mean, that's, that right. is, that's a, that's a risky proposition. I mean, these are very, <laughs> very powerful drugs and they're very addictive. I mean, people can't just go in, throw away their suboxone or, or throw away the alcohol. I mean, this is, you know, these are powerful drugs and, and they also have addictive qualities to them. So, I mean, there is a real risk of um, anyone just throwing away their medication because these are, these are very powerful, powerful things uh, that should be treated as such. You know, I certainly at, at any stages do not want to underestimate um, how challenging it, it, it will be for anybody to, stop taking psychiatric medication the same way that it's right. challenging for anybody to, you know, stop using any substance that by its nature is, um, you know, highly addictive. Right. I've been there many times and there's nothing easy about coming off of, especially a medication that I've been on for over 20 years. Um, I've, tr- I've tried to wean myself off of it because it caused so much weight gain and I was violently, violently ill for a very long time. So I've seen yeah. it and I've been there. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and, um, and I would, I would want to acknowledge a very, very powerful resource for people that is free that's okay. available online. 
Uh, it's called the Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off of Psychiatric Drugs. And it's a, it's a manual that you can download as a free PDF, for the Harm Reduction Guide for Coming Off of Psychiatric Drugs. And it's published by the Icarus Project, who's a sort of a social justice and advocacy, advocacy organization around mental health. Um, mm-hmm. But it really, it's, it's one of the few pieces of literature that exists that really, you know, approaches this, how do I successfully navigate the experience of trying to come off psychiatric drugs because, uh, based upon what's worked for other people. Um, and so that's a, it's a very valuable resource that people can check out. And uh, it take, you know, so it, even the word harm reduction in the title, um, mm-hmm. you, know, that, you know, that comes back to the addiction recovery community and this approach towards ending our use of substances as maybe the net goal or the immediate goal, but sort of changing our relationship to them and taking more of a harm reduction approach than, um, been saying it's just, you know, it's either I'm on my medication or I'm throwing it into the, into the garbage. Because many, many people try and come off psychiatric drugs and, and can't do it successfully because it's a right. very, very difficult thing to do. And you need to have a social support network in place. You need to have people around you who understand how difficult what you're trying to do is. Um, and, you know, there are some people that can do a cold turkey. There are some people that it takes years and years and years. I mean, I've heard that benzodiazepines are – harder to withdraw from than heroin. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you for that resource. That's definitely important. I'm glad that we got that out there. Yeah. Um, Hey, PJ, would you talk with us a bit about the three people that the film focuses on, uh, Jen, Dan, and Oryx? Yep. So starting with Oryx, you know, Oryx is one of the co-producers of the film. You know, he's really been my partner on this project going back to the very beginning. And, um, you know, he was never really, he was always going to kind of be in the movie in some way because he's, he, he's, he's an activist. He works for an organization called the National Empowerment Center, which is, you know, they're, they're, they're helping peer, peer groups get off the ground uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, you know, they're, they're actually federally funded. Um, and so Oryx is doing some really meaningful work and is kind of on the front lines of this, you know, the, uh, the survivor movement. So he was always going to kind of be a subject in the film as well, but it just kind of turned out because of how things played out with his own personal life. He became maybe more of a subject in the film than we had even envisioned him to be. Um, And Dan Sullivan is someone who lives here around me locally. It's always kind of nice when you make a film like this to have a subject you don't have to like get on a plane to go shoot with. (laughs) Dan, Dan is just a young man that I met, you know, many years ago who I just, just deeply, deeply admire. He's just so articulate and, and wise and funny and sweet and just a really great human being. And, you know, and he has a way of our, he's a, he's a a Brazilian man who is living here in Amherst, Massachusetts. And um, he's in his, I believe he's in his late twenties now, mid to late twenties. And um, he can, he, you know, Dan is someone who has lived with voices for, um, and, and visions for his entire life. And he can really speak to these things in such a way that very few people I've ever encountered have the ability to just kind of articulate these experiences with such humor and, and, and good nature and insightfulness. Um, so he mm-hmm. really was just uh, a wonderful, wonderful subject for the film. And, uh, and Jen is somebody who lives out in Rapid City, South Dakota, who is a mother who's also an activist. Um, and I met her through work. I was out there doing some work um, for her organization and we just, met and struck up a friendship and um you know we certainly want it was it was nice to have sort of a midwestern middle america type archetype also someone who's a mother in the film um but you know i mean mm-hmm. these oryx jen and, yes. and dan they've all been given the most serious of diagnoses you know, bipolar schizoaffective schizophrenia um and you know they've all in their own ways found strategies to kind of navigate through life and i will say that the I believe after all this work and seeing, you know, listening to thousands of people's stories over many years, I, that one common thread that you can't do without here is uh, having a social support network. You know, mm-hmm. people really need a social support network when they go through hard times, you know, and, and that's what one of the things that I think brings a lot of people back to, you know, back to life, back to, back to, you know, the, back to the universe, back to a, a sense of, you know, of meaning is just really finding other people to connect with um, that they can rely on in, in times of meeting. You guys are fortunate, to, very fortunate to have each other. Um, but, you know, I think yes, that that's yeah, one yeah, of the, we are, yeah. 
but you know, and, and but not everybody has that. Um, and so I, you know, I think pe- some of the people that really, you know, not speaking just for the characters in the film, but the people that really continue to struggle with, you know, with finding the right supports. I mean, so much of it is about trying to build that social support network. And what a lot of these peer run organizations, you know, peer by the word, by peer, I mean, people who have been through the mental health system and are now trying to, in some ways are on the other side of it, but are trying to help people that are in the same situation that they've been in because um, mm-hmm. they've been there. And so there's a real peer movement here in the U S um, much more so than in many other countries. Um, and, you know, it's kind of really grounded in this, in this notion that, um, you know, create the importance of that social support network. And a lot of these you know, sort of grassroots organizations that exist all over the country, one of the, the main things they do on a community level is provide events for the public, provide training for people, provide these opportunities for people to come together and, um, you know, build some life skills, but also to find connections so they can help grow that social support network. Social support network. Absolutely. Uh And on that note, we are going to have to take one more quick break. It'll be our last break. Uh, You'll be listening to Andrew Heller, Summer Wind. Summer wind came blowing in from across the sea. It lingered there to touch your hair and walk with me. All summer long we sang a song and then we strolled that golden sand. Welcome back to Voices for Change 2.0. We are so glad that you are with us today. We, yes, we are. We are speaking to a gentleman by the name of P.J. Moynihan. He's the director of Healing Voices, a documentary about mental health. And, uh, P.J., you have some big news. You have a huge event coming up based around the film, uh, May 2nd through May 4th. Would you like to talk a little bit about that for our listeners in case they are interested? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you know, so Healing Voices has been screening all over the world for the last year. Um, there's been mm-hmm. between 
four and 500 screenings, large and small, by this point. They've all been followed by these really, really powerful community dialogues that, you know, that are in response to the issues that the film evokes. Um, and, you know, so in, in a sense, Healing Voices is still in theaters, if you think about it, in relationship to a traditional movie. Um, you, you haven't been able to buy the film as a digital download for nine ninety nine or on DVD, apart from at some special events. So we, we really have withheld it as a consumer product through this window mm-hmm. of wanting the film to be kind of event-based. It's a social action initiative. And so to us, the action was bringing communities, communities together. And so instead mm-hmm. of playing at the local multiplex and regal cinemas or wherever, you know, we've been showing in colleges and in community centers and doing some of our own theatrical events. So we really just kind of redefined what it meant to be in a theatrical window for a film such as ours. And and, and it's kind of radical in terms of, um, you know, a a film like ours making its way to market. Um, You know, there are other companies that are doing similar things like Tug is doing similar sort of on-demand screenings in communities. And there's a company called Gather who's really, you know, sort of focusing on non-theatrical um, events for films such as ours. We've really done all this ourselves as a, as the production company, but we're also now the distribution company. Uh, and so it's been an interesting journey. And, you know, and, and what, we're, what we're doing to kind of close out this theatrical window and, to, and mark the film's release on home video, uh, which we'll be selling ourselves directly from our website, healingvoicesmovie.com. You know, that date is May 2nd. Uh, the film's going to be available as a consumer product. But we're doing a kind of a, a big global event to close out this this event window, uh, and we're calling it Recovering Community. So we have the dates May 2nd to May 4th on a lot of our marketing materials. Truth be told, you know, people need a bit more flexibility to organize events in terms of finding venues and this and that. So essentially starting late April and running through May, um, there are going to be screenings of Healing Voices all over the world. There's about 70 or 80 events that are confirmed. Uh, there's still an wow. opportunity to um, to produce a screening in your local community by contacting us. All, all the information is available on our website. Uh, and again, this, these events could be in people's living rooms. They could be in town halls. They could be in independent movie theaters. Sort of whatever uh, the event organizer locally chooses, uh, that's you know what these events turn into. Uh, but again, they're all followed by discussion, and they're all tied into this you know this release of the film on and around. Uh, on May 2nd. Um, but, you know, there, so for your listeners, you know, there is a, a very good chance that there'll be screenings coming to their community, especially if they're here in the U.S. Um, and for, you know, any sort of local organizers out there, there's still an opportunity to, to get on this bus and, and organize a great event. It could be later in May if you need some, some more lead time. Um, but we're really kind of closing our, this chapter of Healing Voices story. Uh, with this with this one big event, and we called it recovering community because again, coming back to the social action piece um, mm-hmm. we we really believe the film is carrying a message of recovery that many of the messages that people get in mental health are kind of inherently negative uh, and right. we believe we're the, the candle bearers of, of hope here we 're saying that people can and do recover from even the most extreme diagnoses and the most extreme experiences you could imagine. Um, and so, you know, we believe that getting that message to communities to, you know, hopefully start that butterfly effect of social action where someone tells their neighbor about it, their neighbor watches the movie, they have a son who maybe goes into crisis a year later, and, and that there's this awareness that builds around the many ways in which we need to respond to people in crisis. Um, and, and it's a message of hope, mm-hmm. and it's a message of healing. Um, and, you know, and I think that it's not hard to acknowledge that in our world today in March of 2017, there's a lot of healing that needs to take place. Um, Absolutely. And so these are really, we believe, you know, very powerful, positive, forward thinking, galvanizing community events that we're, you know, kind of opening up the opportunity for local people to engage in. Uh, and so, you know, if you can't make it to a screening for a recovering community, there's not one near you. Uh, you will be able to buy the film starting on May 2nd. Uh, it'll be right through our website, healingvoicesmovie.com. But I do want to encourage any of your listeners who really want to become a part of this conversation to contact us directly through the website and explore um, of organizing a local event. 
And it's it's timely with uh, matching up with Mental Health Awareness Month. Yes, in May, May is too. Mental Health Awareness Month, so that um, is perfect timing. Yeah. Can you uh, give us some of the uh, social media information as well, in case anyone uh, would like to follow you on Twitter and whatnot? Yep. So so um, we are at Voices Movie on Twitter and on Instagram. We also have a Facebook group and a Facebook fan page. You can, you'll find that just by, you know, punching in healing voices into Facebook. Um, and, you know, certainly that's, that, those are places where we make information about events available and are trying to build an audience as well. So, you know, certainly give us a follow. We'll, we'll follow you back. Um, and, you know, just stay tuned. There's going to be a lot, of, a lot of noise coming out of the Healing Voices camp in the next 45 days including some, some big <laughs> events. You know, we're, we're, doing a, we're doing a big screening at Yale University wow. uh, on May 2nd it, you know, in a 350-seat theater in front of a whole lot of medical professionals. We'll be live streaming that panel in Q&A. Uh, we're gonna yeah, that won't be intimidating in, at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're doing a large event in New York City on May 13th, which we're going to be announcing this week. There's going to be a big screening cool. in Melbourne, Australia on May 4th. Uh, that panel will also be live streamed. So there's going to be a lot of action coming out of our camp, like I said, in the next, uh, you know, six weeks or so, as we, amidst all other things, treat ourselves like any other movie that's trying to get released and uh, just make sure that people know about it is really what it comes down to at this point. We're confident in what the film is, and we believe it carries a very important message. Uh, And now we just want people to know that it exists. Absolutely, and you're definitely getting your message out there, and I think that's amazing, and I I congratulate you and everyone involved in the project. I think that uh, it's it's important that everyone sees the film that has any questions about mental illness, that deals with mental illness, has a family member, a friend, Mm -hmm. you know, themselves is has been diagnosed with something. I think it's it's really, really important to view all aspects of the the mental health community so that you're educated and you know what is and isn't stigma. And that's, mm-hmm. you know, what I was saying before, that's what we're all here for. That's what we're all trying to avoid. Yeah. So, you know, we congratulate you on being able to come to, to bring the film on such large scales, you know, yeah, and the, and what you have coming up is is all very very exciting too. You know, uh, some some great events coming up. You know, if this stuff is happening in your area, by all means, search it out, check it out. It's worth your time. It's worth the discussion. Um, and again, that's www.healingvoicesmovie.com yep. is where you can find uh, the information for the film. But it looks like we are about out of time with you today, PJ, but we are really grateful that you were with us today and you you have been a fantastic, fantastic guest and given us so much valuable information. I, I can't wait for the feedback on the show. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time today with us. We We really appreciate it. Well, it's good to be connected and thank you both for the work that you're doing. We, you know, we're all, we're all just trying to create a, a healthier world for ourselves to to grow up in, right? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, we got to grow up. <laughs> I don't want to grow up. So if you'll just uh, stay on the line, we are going to finish up, and uh, we will uh, talk to you guys next week. Yep. Have a great day. See ya. Join us next week. As Rebecca and Joe continue to battle the stigma of mental illness, follow us on Twitter at Voices for Change RJ and on Facebook at Voices for Change 2.0.